All right, good morning, everyone. And I know there'll be more people joining um, as the next couple of minutes come in, but I'll get the intro going so we have plenty of time for our honored guests to speak today. Um, I'm Bessie Leakey Anist. I am Senior Director at the Mesh Academy and also Business Director for the Rosalie and Harold Ray Brown Center for Cancer Drug Development at the USC Norris Conference of Cancer Center. It's a new center that was launched this past year and we're very excited um, to support the mission to accelerate promising oncology therapeutics into the clinic um, through a model that is focused on collaborative drug development. Um, we have a lot of information on CCDD. Please um, don't hesitate to contact me after the seminar, but in general, the scope of CCDD is very broad to looking at all therapeutic modalities. Um, and Dr. Jajewska today will talk more about that. We're looking, obviously, as an academic institution, we'll have things more from the early target validation stage to preclinical stages with a focus on oncology and the unmet needs in that space. So um, we have um, the next cycle for submission is open. If you have an interesting oncology target that you'd like us um, to consult with and see if it fits um, with the CCDD and entering the review, please don't hesitate to contact us. The information is here, but you always have our emails or directly with uh, Melissa Rogers on our team managing the review process. You can email her directly as well and the website information. So that deadline is November 1st. This will be the second cohort and we're very excited um, to get the second um, submission open and kicking off, we are kicking off the CCD virtual seminar series with um, a strong um, um, list of experts seen here. These are our four external advisory committee members for the CCDD. And you'll see their, their um, titles and their um, seminar descriptions here. This is all very focused on educating in these various topics. The registration links are there below. And today we're focusing on, do I have a drug target? Um, with Dr. Eva Tujarska, who's, um, I mentioned our EAC member, and we're very honored to have her here today. Um, she has an extensive amount of experience in industry um, over 20 years. Um, she's been a founding employee of Anilam Pharmaceuticals and has led commercial and biopharma development strategy for various consulting firms seen here as Putnam and Halloran. Um, the last few years, um, prior to her most recent job at Zontogeny at Evotech, she was senior vice president and led the academic partnership initiative um, through the bridge partnerships. And it's a very interesting model that we are also very interested in here at USC to de-risk early stage science via drug discovery and development. She'll um, touch on that today. And also we can have follow-up conversations with Dr. Jajarska also as um, the seminar um, after the seminar and have different meetings that we can set up with you if you see something that may fit um, her interest in academic partnerships, as well as her most recent position as vice president of portfolio operations at Zontogeny, which is a Boston-based accelerator that supports and funds um, various um, seed raises and series raises for therapeutics and devices. Um, they, you see the various information here. I'll go through this part quickly. The main um, takeaway here is to have her name in your mind and her experience and the different ways that she has um, worked in academia and in industry that could help us advise and accelerate your projects. As I mentioned, she's a member of our CCDD. She's actively involved in reviewing the projects and providing us with her feedback. So I'm very honored, um, Eva, to have you with us today and um, helping us get a, a stronger perspective on all the nuances as you'll be telling us today about of how do I have a drug target and how do we determine if it's ready um, to get started. So Eva, I'm very happy to have you here and I'm going to stop my share so you can share your screen and also give uh, probably a couple more people time to join and welcome. Thank you very much Vas, to you and your team uh, and for the invitation from CCDD. And thanks everyone for joining this morning, this afternoon, whatever you are. Very excited to be here. The title of the seminar is, Do I Have a Drug Target? And I'm hoping you will all take away from our conversation some frameworks of how to determine if your research program is ready for uh, drug discovery. 
I'm sure you have seen this drug discovery and development cycle many different times. I'd love to iterate that the successful development and launch of therapeutics that will benefit patients does require concerted efforts from all ecosystem uh, stakeholders. And you as the academics that do uh, the basic research discovery and innovation lies with you. So you start the cycle of discovery and many academics continue to participate in preclinical development as well as clinical development with different partnerships um, with the industry. The industry being pharma and biotech, but also uh, various CROs which uh, enable academics to de-risk early stage science and can provide critically missing uh, drug discovery expertise. Uh, government and non-government organizations that provide funding are also critically important to fill that uh, early stage translational gaps, as well as perspective and help from patients and advocacy groups. So um, what happens when you make a discovery and you publish your paper? This has been funded by uh, you know, some grants and some government uh, uh, work. And so now you'd like to consider uh, developing a therapeutic uh, against, for example, noble target that you have discovered. Unfortunately, there's still a, a translational gap. It's a very well known and published uh, phenomenon called the valley of that translational gap. So what happens is that at that stage, the resources available for you to embark on a drug discovery or screening are uh, quite minimal. Um, at that stage, um, pharma or biotech or VCs are not interested for the most part because it's too early for them and they like to come at a much later stage. And so there are a number of challenges uh, that come with that. It's not just the funding, but how do you conceptualize the opportunity? How do you take that basic research discovery and turn that into novel uh, therapeutic? Um, so um, then another gap is the drug discovery expertise. What are the steps that you can take in order for you to discover a molecule that will affect this target and what assays and systems you're going to use? We did talk about funding and indeed at that stage, uh, there's minimal resources to do that and, and you need funding to, to be able to execute that either internally or with partners. And if for a second we can um, take a more holistic uh, view as well, some of the incentives and the metrics that universities and particularly tech transfer offices put in place uh, are still centered on out licensing and um, uh, their, their you know, short term metrics. Um, however, the good news is that in the past 10 years, we have seen very significant change of how universities and university associated groups have bridged those gaps. Um, accelerators and incubators um, and, and organizations like CCDD are very much um, active and able to partner with you and provide consultancy to conceptualize what the opportunity is and how to turn your discovery into an actual therapeutic. Uh, there are also industry advisors like myself and my colleagues at the uh, executive advisory group for CCDD that we can help. Um, uh, conceptualize the opportunity. Also, many accelerators uh, and universities provide translational grants um, to either prove or disprove your therapeutic hypothesis. So this provides the critical funding in these early stages uh, to uh, de-risk your early stage science. Also, many groups like CCDD can partner with you to um, help you apply for additional government funding or uh, facilitate industry sponsored research agreements or MTAs, which can further help uh, with industry partnerships. If you're not familiar with CCDD's uh, partnership with Sanford Burnham, we'll talk about this in a minute, and I also encourage you to reach out to them. Uh, this is a group that can help with high throughput screening. Uh, and again, 
uh, industry advisor and ex in execution of your drug, uh, drug discovery. And lastly, in the past 10 years, there have been numerous examples of academic uh, founders of uh, some very well um, developed uh, startups, also uh, academics being on scientific advisory boards or clinical advisory boards, in addition to more traditional licensing and SRA. So there's many different opportunities that have been uh, set up and put in place, including USC, that can help bridge that translational gap. So how do we know if we have a promising project? Uh, there are four main questions that one can ask. If we put our drug developer hat, first, can you create it? Uh, does it work? Uh, do you own it? And does anyone want it? These are the four main questions we all ask. And of course, uh, below all of that, every single project that we see, uh, we evaluate three main categories. Uh, we evaluate the scientific considerations, development considerations, and commercial considerations. And I'll reference these three buckets throughout my presentation today. Of course, on the scientific side, uh, is it novel science? Do we have a novel target, novel pathway, novel interaction within a pathway? And how novel is the science? We also look at the level of target and pathway validation. And I'll touch upon that in more detail in a few minutes. Um, another very important aspect uh, uh, evaluating the scientific merit is what is the drug ability? of the target and pathway, um, and, and can we actually create a drug? On the development side, we look at current existence of clinical and regulatory precedents to get us to a clinical proof of concept. And also, what is the, you know, the, the path to clinical proof of concept? For a project that is so early in the um, academic uh, or, in, or its drug development uh, stage, we don't necessarily need time and budget to proof of concept. What's very useful here though, is to uh, have a very clearly articulated uh, patient population that you'll be targeting. The third bullet point here, commercially available target product profile is able to be defined. It's one point that it's less understood. I'll give you the following example. Um, at the point that we evaluate your, your project and whether it's promising, what we'll need to understand collectively is, do we need a daily oral drug or do we need a uh, once a monthly subcutaneously administered biologic? Or for example, we might need a topically uh, administered cream. So this is the level of target product profile uh, concept that we need to have at that stage because uh, of the target population that we're serving. On the commercial side, uh, we look at the met medical need, we look at the density of the competitive landscape, what is the degree of uh, differentiation, is it uh, disease modifying, uh, uh, therapeutic and mechanism of action, as well as what is the potential for partnering. I'm sure you all understand that very few projects lie squarely in the middle of all of these three areas. Um, if they do, um, probably someone else would have done it by now. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's okay not to have all of these elements as a check. This is why um, it's, it's a large team that's typically involved in the development of therapeutics. Um, I'll just give you an example. Um, if there's currently no clinical and regulatory precedence, that's not the sole reason why a project will be rejected. Currently at Zontogeny, we have a startup that's aiming to develop first-in-class therapeutic for, for neonates uh, in a very unique way. The way to resolve this is you have a uh, world-class clinical and regulatory experts at your team and you work very closely with the FDA uh, to get an agreement on what the development path early on would be. Another example is also um, if you're targeting somewhat of a small patient population, that cannot be the sole reason why your project is dismissed. And you'll see in a, a example of Locks Oncology in a minute that um, they have had a very good commercial success targeting relatively small patient population. 
So um, the drug discovery and development continuum, you can see here, typically an academic project is in the idea generation and sourcing phase or target ID and validation. And what are some of the discovery decisions and actions that we have to uh, make a decision on at this point? Um, very important, which target we're going to target, what therapeutic modality we're going to use. And um, as you all know, there's, there's many different ones that are currently in development, not just the small molecule peptides, biologics, but also gene therapy, different modulators and degraders, et cetera. And what is the mode of action? Do we need agonist? Do we need antagonist? Do we need some other modulator? And so this, these decisions cast a very long shadow. Uh, these decisions should be made as iterative process as, as we discussed earlier, based on the scientific developability and the commercial considerations. Because once you decide this is the target, this is the modality, uh, this is the mechanism of action we want to have, uh, you put your precious non-dilutive dollars to uh, embark on anywhere from eight to 18 months process until you see what's the result, what's the outcome uh, of this campaign. So uh, these decisions have a very long shadow, uh, cast a very long shadow as uh, part of the drug development. Some of the other really important decisions are what assays to use, what cell line, what model, what heat ID approach, if that's a small molecule. Um, and these are conversations where you have to bring industry experts at your table. Um, as we mentioned multiple times, CCDD is a great partner for you uh, in the conceptual conceptualization phase. Um, and they have brought to the table Sanford Burnham, uh, which will be able to help with some screening approaches. I also highly recommend you attend the following seminars from my colleagues, which some of which will center on small molecule discovery and how to pick the right uh, approach to that, but also on, on biologics and what is the right approach for, for development there. And if you look at this continuum, partners like CCDD, Sanford Burnham, and, and other potential partners come very early. This is where the Bridges program at Evotech uh, was very uh, good at partnering and de-risking early stage um, science from academic institutions. And on this continuum where other partners like venture groups, biotech and pharma come are much later stages. Um, most uh, VCs like to come at lead optimization or a good lead. Um, some of them uh, on a platform could come earlier as well, but under different uh, business terms. Pharma, I would like to see a lot more data than that. So um, uh, early, generating early data with your existing partners, uh, it's, it's crucial. Now, when we talk about target validation and, and what constitutes a, a well-validated target, and, and I have to preface this by saying majority of the projects that we would see um, from academic founders will be related to novel target or novel mechanism of action. And so there is significant amount of data, as you know, that um, uh, goes into validating a target or a pathway. And, and feel free to use these frameworks as a guidance when the, the slides are distributed. That's a more of a qualitative uh, framework that can be used. Um, so what, what is the amount of data that's necessary? And I'll jump to the conclusion right away to say that what's reasonable and necessary to expect as a level of validation before starting a drug discovery campaign will vary significantly between projects, between targets and also disease areas. And, also what constitutes a minimum package will vary. So um, as you can imagine going from left to right, most significant amount of validation data comes from clinical trials. Uh, both successful and unsuccessful efforts can be very informative um, with any therapeutic modality. Uh, then the second level uh, would be human genetics data, whether it's loss of function, gain of function or dominant negative data. 
uh, it's very helpful to have both on the efficacy side as well as the safety side. Particularly in oncology, it's, it's uh, almost a must have um, to have human expression data in normal uh, and disease tissue, um, as well as any target, uh, novel target interaction with a known uh, or validated pathway. Um, next in line will be your typical animal model data. And, and of course the least uh, sort of trusted system will be your in vitro uh, system data. Uh, these speak mostly to the efficacy uh, part. However, there are a number of considerations that have to evaluate the safety as well. And both uh, previous and this slide were developed, uh, qualitative approaches developed for the Evotech uh, Bridges program. So looking at the parameters on the left, we typically look at uh, you know, the signaling pathway and whether the effect is in line with, uh, with the signaling model. Um, then more on the, um, about the safety and the, the efficacy side, what uh, homologies exist and how selective one can be um, targeting the particular target and how, whether there's a sufficient data to evaluate that. What is the drug ability of the target and the pathway? What prior experience, um, as we just discussed, but also what data, what models, are there homologies, their crystal structure uh, that you have in order to embark on a new drug discovery campaign? A very important point is the next point, whether the function is consistent with the role in disease and the target cell types. Uh, sometimes that's one in oncology and then very different if you go, for example, to, to lung uh, and, and, and other diseases. So all of that has to be evaluated very carefully. Um, expression, whether the expression is specific um, as it relates to target safety, whether it's expressed only the target cell population or it's widely expressed. And, and, and here, you have to, to look at all of that data prior to deciding what your therapeutic modality is going to be. For example, uh, if you need to avoid uh, a gut targeting, um, uh, targeting of this particular target, you might wanna go with an antibody and not a small molecule. Um, you know, similar considerations come in play. If you have a systemic issue, you might have to deliver locally. Um, or um, you know different considerations on the on the therapeutic modality and where it goes. Then we look at proof of concept as related to target efficacy. Uh, we just discussed that on the previous slide. And similarly, you can derive safety signals from human genetics and from animal model data. Uh, last but not least, what tools and assays are there for drug discovery? How well validated those tools and assays are and those models are. And I can tell you that there have been a number of examples of very um, potentially interesting uh, mechanisms of action uh, in, in populations that are very underserved with um, models that are not translatable into clinic that have been, um, you know, required additional, additional research and development. I also highly recommend the paper that's cited on the bottom. This was uh, very recently published in Nature by a German group uh, and got it stands for guidance on target assessment for innovative therapeutics. I, I, I do think it provides very useful frameworks for both efficacy and safety. Uh, they have also done a very detailed literature search uh, and have some uh, recommendations for frameworks. So what we're gonna do in the next couple of slides, I am going to go through my own experience and opinion and everything that I say during the seminar today is my opinion and perspective only and not that, that of my current or past employers. But we're gonna go through what does not work and why. Um, and some of these do not work as a standalone drug discovery campaign. However, they could be well suited for partnership opportunities. And of course, we're going to talk about what works for a standalone um, drug discovery campaign. And, and all of these could lead potentially to partnerships later. 
Uh, if you look as a rule of uh, thumb uh, on the commercial value that's generated um, from, from these um, partnership models, uh, left to right, it's obviously higher. So the more time and effort uh, and resources he spent in conceptualizing opportunity, identifying tool molecules, uh, and risking the science, uh, there's larger commercial value when partnered. So what does not work when evaluating opportunities for drug discovery? And I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the webinar. Um, what does not work is if your drug will only work as a combination therapy. Um, we've seen a, a lot of efforts to, for example, boost uh, PD-1, PD-L1 efficacy lately. And so this does not work for two reasons. Um, one, um, FDA would like to see efficacy of each individual drug, unless it's a fixed combination of drugs. So you'll have to prove a single um, agent efficacy uh, of your therapeutic before you can combine it with uh, another agent. And, and second, I mean, this is a big consideration for VCs. And, and second is the developability challenge, relying on another company to, to get to, to market. So um, that could potentially be a good opportunity for partnership and we'll discuss this on the next slide. What does not work is if the drug will work in every cancer that overexpresses target X without clear addressable population with tumor expression or tumor validation data in a way of identifying patients. And so the reason why this does not work is, is just too broad. It's still too broad. It requires additional conceptualization work to identify what is the best drug opportunity. Another uh, example that does not work is if your first addressable uh, patient population is where all development efforts have failed, for example, small cell lung cancer or pancreatic cancer, but without the strong mechanism of action or therapeutic hypothesis. And for example, if, if for example, your mechanism can work in any cancer, but for your development, you chose those two, um, that, that's gonna raise a lot of questions. And you'll see on one of the examples, if you have a strong mechanism of action and therapeutic hypothesis that's specific to these indications, that's actually a really good opportunity to design what I call the killer experiment. Um, uh, a very well-defined experiment with go, no, go decision that can either validate or invalidate your therapeutic hypothesis. So um, another example that does not work is if you're aiming to repurpose or retool an approved drug, particularly ones that are still under patent protection. We've seen a lot of examples of that from people that do not have uh, medicinal chemistry background or collaborators. And, the reason for that being a very challenging value proposition is because biotech and pharma does not like to leave and turn stone. And in almost all cases, uh, all chemical space around the drug that is on the market and protected will have been explored and already covered under IP. If we look at platforms, for example, novo drug delivery platforms, if your value proposition states that you can utilize any targeted agent for any cancer type with any payload, however, you don't have the generated the data for a specific drug that has both scientific developability and commercial rationale, that is a very, um, very hard value proposition. It's again, too broad. It requires both conceptual work and actual lab work to produce uh, a drug. Um, so platforms become interesting when they can provide an effective drug. And last um, example here that I have is um, less compelling investment is often a standalone, standalone diagnostic. However, uh, some of these could be very uh, good opportunity for, for partnership. So as I mentioned earlier, if your proposed drug or mechanism of action will work as a combination therapy with a potential partner's drug, that's a good way for partnership. Um, 
I personally recommend before um, reach, before investing some dollars into developing such drug, um, have a conversation with the farmer, the biotech, um, have your uh, you know data package and discuss uh, what would they be interested, what gaps do they see. Uh, at the least, you will get some really good critique and some really good questions that will help you further clarify your value proposition and development path. Um, similarly, if you have discovered the utility for an approved drug in, in a different indication, uh, that is not uh, the best uh, opportunity for a standalone company because now you have to uh, discover a new therapeutic. However, it's a great opportunity for a collaboration particularly if you have some platforms or cell types or systems where the partner can validate their uh, drug uh, preclinically in your system. And you'll hear at one of the case studies that we have later for Lux Oncology, how that could have been a very good opportunity for academic founders. Uh, Talking about platform, if your platform could potentially improve performance of existing drugs, for example, provide a longer half-life or deliver tissue-specific uh, delivery or have a dual targeting, um, that is a good opportunity for partnership. Um, of course, some of these could very well be a standalone um, funding opportunities and standalone company. However, the capital requirement and the expertise to advance a platform is quite high. Um, and you have to come up with a concept drug that is not performing well and, and produce that. So in the context of an academic development, uh, this is the reason why I have put such platform uh, under opportunities for partnership. I did mention earlier standalone biomarkers, also biomarker panels, new methods of diagnosis, treatment, follow up. There are various partners that could be um, uh, good partners for development of such methods and such biomarkers. Very well known and utilized by academics are novel cell based systems or organoid systems or tissue based systems that could be used for drug discovery or for drug development. Uh, and uh, biotech and pharma looks um, extensively at such for validation and, and non-clinical development. And as you all know, novel animal models that are relevant to human disease are also very lucrative, mostly mammalian uh, models, uh, but also animal models for drug discovery or for drug production or for drug evaluation and such can be partnered with a developer like Taconic or Jack's Lab and the academic institution uh, can benefit from sales and royalties. Now, what does work when evaluating opportunities for drug discovery? Um, majority of the times when we see uh, academic proposal for funding, it starts with a novel target or a novel mechanism of action. And typically we like to see a strong mechanistic rationale, or uh, if one does not exist yet, uh, we'd like to see a very clear path to prove a mechanistic rationale in the tumor type of interest. What I called earlier, uh, the killer experiment with a clear go, no go decisions. What also works very well, if there's a tool compound um, that demonstrates drug ability of the target pathway, this could be an old compound that's published or a compound obviously that the PI has discovered um, on, on their own. So in, in the second case, that could serve as a good uh, chemistry starting point. Also what works very well is if there's a unique screening platform or a system, um, either human organoids or some unique phenotypic screen assays, and even better if it has some starting chemical matter. And, and this type of um, the risking and experiment is ideal to partner with someone like CCDD and Sanford Burnham to discover, and it could be done with relatively efficient um, uh, resources. And it's something that at that point, it's a really good project to be evaluated, even by some uh, VCs that like to come to early stage uh, academic projects. 
Um, two other ideas that are not standalone ideas, that are not standalone projects, however, they're great to have as an add-on to an existing idea is when there's a clear way to identify and stratify patients that can uh, provide a really big clinical and potentially payer advantage. And you'll see this uh, in a minute into the LOXO example. Also ideas where early pharmacodynamic marker is available, and those are extremely useful to understand uh, target engagement and target modulation, both in non-clinical and clinical setting. If we talk about platforms, what works for platforms? The platform has to be sufficiently validated. Obviously, it will depend on your platform is. However, if there's a prototype drug that has been made uh, and you can scale this up um, and you have demonstrated that it targets appropriate cells or organ types, uh, that's very useful to have. And in some cases where applicable, part of the minimum requirement package is um, to demonstrate that uh, it's non-immunogenic. Last but not least, and something that um, everyone would like to see is the team and whether the work that's proposed uh, is proposed by experts in, in, in that particular area. So um, it's, it's okay to have collaborators and, and it's welcome to have um, collaborators teams that are able to execute on the proposed work. Obviously, all of these opportunities can lead to partnerships at some later stage, and depending on what the opportunity is, could be earlier, or you could have some non-dilutive work done via translational grant, translational fund, or seed fund, and partnered at the later stage. So now a couple of case studies, and um, the first one that I wanted to share with you today is Lox Oncology. I'm sure everyone's familiar with uh, the precision oncology company that Loxo is. Perhaps what not everybody knows is how Loxo started. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, um, uh, around 2013, uh, so first of all, Loxo targets uh, fusion um, proteins for neurotropic receptor tyrosine kinase and for RET, and those are very well validated targets with their role in oncology. And so around 2013 um, was the time when NTRK was published by an academic group that uh, it's very prevalent, not only in colorectal cancer, but also in other variety of tumor types, including soft tissue sarcoma, salivary gland, fibrosarcoma, thyroid cancer, and lung cancer. And so uh, following on that publication and that discovery, the Lox Oncology team, which was a very experienced uh, drug developer team, forged a collaboration with Array, a company that had capabilities in development uh, TRK inhibitors. And so um, also uh, receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors are very well validated drug target class. And between 2014 and 2019, there were about 31 kinase inhibitors that were approved by the FDA. And so LOX's strategy was uh, take very well validated targets uh, in oncology, um, develop or license or optimize drugs ag against a very um, well validated drug target class. Um, and so only two years later, uh, OXO, LOXO began the first clinical trial in 2015, um, targeting RTK in 17 different tumor types. And at that time, it took 15 different types of tests and about two years to enroll 55 patients. And so the fact that LOXO was going against uh, genetically validated tumors provided clinical advantage to identify those patients um, and uh, only patients that can benefit from the treatment uh, to be given the drug. And from a payer standpoint, that's also a really big advantage because um, you know, the drug is the expensive piece, not the test, but also patients who will not benefit from the therapy will be spared and they will have the opportunity to enroll in another trial and be given other um, drug. And so 
Um, even though they targeted a very small patient population, um, they are, have had very big commercial success. Uh, culminating in Luxus buyout at a billion dollars and, and partnership with Bayer uh, before the buyout from Lilly. So the, the takeaway here is what enabled Luxo to, to accelerate was really the discovery that the particular fusion is uh, broadly distributed into other uh, uh, tumor types. And so opportunity like that is very well suited for academics to be on set, scientific advisory boards, clinical advisory boards, to collaborate with a company um, under sponsored research agreement or IRB to enable the development of therapeutics. Um, in this case, precision medicine in oncology. I'd like to continue on with two other case studies, which are much earlier stage academic cases. They're anonymized. Those are both case studies that I have reviewed as part of translational grants uh, at a university um, and hopefully much closer to some of the uh, uh, examples and challenges that you are embarking on. Uh, so the first case um, provided the PIs had a novel mechanism of action uh, namely, they were aiming to engineer immune cells to enhance adoptive cell therapy of pancreatic, targeting pancreatic cancer with approach that in this case was very specific to the pancreatic microenvironment. Uh, this was a collaboration of two PIs, one of which was expert in oncology and tumor microenvironment, and the other one uh, was an expert in the very specific metabolic um, enhancement that they were proposing to do. Prior work validated this target uh, and its uh, role in pancreatic cancer, particularly in a mouse model. So we had some really good data to step on. And what they proposed for this uh, project was uh, what I call the killer experiment. Uh, they will um, evaluate the effect of the modified uh, uh, therapeutic cells um, measure some very specific outcomes on the metabolic side, as well as show anti-tumor efficacy of, of these cells. Um, this approach was not without risk. Uh, there were a number of questions that remained on therapeutics in the therapeutic index and the safety of cells that were modified in this way. However, we felt that this is a question that can be addressed at later stage, given the unique approach that's also applied to a very tough uh, cancer like pancreatic cancer. And so in the context of all the other projects that were evaluated at, at that round of funding, this project was funded. And uh, we were very excited to be able to support a novel mechanism of action in a unmet need like pancreatic cancer with relatively effective, um, effective funding grant. The second case study I'd like to share today uh, involved a novel screening platform. Um, this was a platform that utilized um, machine learning and integrated that ph physiologically relevant tissue slice culture to predict, predict the drug response in animal and human models. This particular screening platform was funded in the past successfully and, and it proved to be a really relevant platform. The therapeutic hypothesis uh, was to screen a library of approved drugs for triple negative breast cancer phenotype. Um, and in that work, they had identified several drugs that were currently under patent protection. Uh, however, they targeted host factors and not tumor factors. The intended work for this proposal was to retool the chemical space and derive a novel chemical matter to develop therapeutics for triple negative breast cancer. And I'm sure if you heard my previous uh, couple of slides, you can guess the outcome of this one. Um, this project was not funded. Uh, also, I should mention the PI had no medicinal chemistry background and no medicinal chemist as a collaborator. And so we encouraged the PI to utilize their novel screening platform and identify novel targets or novel molecules with significant phenotypes that then uh, deconvolute for novel targets. And so 
this particular project was not uh, funded uh, in, in um, context of all the other projects proposed for that reason. And so I do hope we have some time for q and I do hope uh, as a takeaway from my talk today, um, you can take that there's no exact recipe for success. However, there's some really good guiding principles. The most important part uh, of this endeavor is the actual process. And so the process of selecting the right target, the selecting the right therapeutic modality, selecting the right indication on what are the right assays and models to investigate that is what's important. And also that process is iterative and requires industry advisors and collaboration. Um, also very important is to think about drug development and commercial considerations very early on and, and bring that, those considerations back to, to iterate and approve on, on your idea. And so I'd like to thank for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Eva. That was exceptional. There's so much important information. I am very happy we're also recording this. A reminder to everyone there online today, we will share this recording after the seminar. And also any questions that we don't get to today, please feel free to contact me and we'll make sure we get those answered for you. Like I mentioned earlier, Dr. Chudarska is part of the CCDD Executive Advisory Committee reviewing projects coming in to um, the submission pipeline. But I will say, if you don't think you're ready to submit um, a, a project, or if you don't think that it's ready, don't hesitate to contact me or Melissa Rogers on my team that's online here and Camillo on Sarah Sabrino. We'd love to talk to you and see if that's the case. And also there could be some preliminary conversations you could have um, with our EAC members um, if you're not sure that you're ready. So we'd love um, for you to contact us. We are opening to questions now. There's a lot of information and I know um, each of you have different types of projects. So we'd love to have your questions either in the chat box or please turn your cameras on. I know it's a virtual seminar, but we'd like to try to get as, as real as we can. We'd love your cameras and um, engage with our speaker. All right, I'll open it up. And Eve, if you'd like to, um, take the, the seminar down and we can see you. That might be okay. helpful unless, unless there needs to be a reference to the slide, I'm not sure. Okay, I stopped sharing. Great, now we see everybody. I think Steve has a question. Okay. Eva, thanks so much. I think that was one of the best uh, frameworks I've ever heard for advising academics on how to enter early stage projects. It was really well thought out. Um, I'd be interested to hear your opinion about um, how well accepted platforms are that, um, you know, are, a lot of our investigators end up identifying transcription factors. <laughs> um, and they're transcription factors that have, you know, very attractive activities um, in, in a tumor cell of interest with a, a rationale for how you can identify when that transcription factor um, is activity is relevant specific to oncogenicity. And so, um, you know, a lot of the time, um, what happens, I think, it, with, with academics is, um, and I know this is the case for me, is we end up finding ways to try to indirectly target those transcription factors. Um, through small molecule targetable um, activities that might affect their degradation, phosphorylation, et cetera. But where do you see platforms like ASOs, um, like um, Protax? Um, and also, I think these days with some of the virtual screening activities, um, uh, how are transcription factors being dealt with these days in the modern drug discovery environment? Steve, thank you for this question. I'm slightly underprepared to answer uh, very specifically how our transcription factors address. So I'm happy to get back to you on this. However, I'm happy to take a step back and talk about ASOS and PROTAX as a yeah. 
as a modality and how that right. can be utilized. And so, as you well know, ASOS are very well established at this point, as is siRNA and other RNA modalities. And um, how are they applied, right? However, is where the, 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 the key and the innovation is in this case. And so that is in contrast to Protex, which are still very much, <laughs> uh, I'm not telling anything new to anybody here, are very much unproven, uh, right? Uh, with regards to the, the platform, its applicability, um, its utilization into the clinic, as well as tissue specificity. And so um, I'm not sure that answers your question entirely. Um, and, and again, as I said, there's a lot to be said about the process of how um, you know, we can, and indirect targeting is absolutely fine. Um, you know, everyone's happy to find the best way um, to target a challenging target. So um, how do you go about it is, is, um, is the key, but I'll have to get back to you particularly on transcription factors. Any other questions? I got one, sorry, I'm working and I'm asking this question. This is Mike, I'm with Steve Grossman. Um, Good to have you. So, excuse me. So I got a drug which actually a company, um, like, you know, they stopped working with down because it was just toxic a lot of retinal toxicity and hemotoxicity. Um, but uh, I am coming up with an approach where like, you're trying to get it better. Um, and how can I uh, tap the resources of the company? I mean, establishing a potential collaborative uh, approach and also uh, like, you know, trying to ha uh, like, you know, harness or uh, harvest their own data and see what shortcomings um, you know they had while I was uh, while they were working with it. So how do we go about this? Is the company, if I may ask, uh, if I understand Siva. correctly, so it's a company that currently has a drug either in development or in the clinic, and you've improved upon their safety profile. They shut down the program because it was uh, like they were into phase one. This is Tiva Pharmaceuticals. Um, so they were into uh, phase one and they found that there's a lot of uh, blood related uh, toxicity associ uh, associated with also with retinal, uh, uh, you know, that's the problem. So they, yep. they just didn't go with it. And even Genentech, uh, they brought in a secondary uh, uh, generation or second or third generation, if you may, and Genentech put the curtains on these drugs. Um, the target is awesome. Um, and it's working in my hands in, uh, at a lower concentration. Uh, if I have to tap the resource and probably and potentially establish a collab, uh, is there a way our companies bound by certain IP or something if they don't wanna share? How do we go about this? So without knowing all of the details, I, I, I can say there's, depending on what your approach to improvement is, whether you're, improving directly their drug, or you have found another way to target the same target, there cool. needs to be a different sort of data package that goes with that. Uh, obviously, if you're targeting the same target with a different drug, you have to have more substantial data, as opposed to you've improved on their current drug, even though the program is, is locked. From a business, it's closed. From a business development effort, I think you have multiple options. Uh, going back to the originator companies, only one, uh, they may or may not have, um, you know, interest in renewing this. There are a number of other developers, however, that will be very interested in now uh, understanding uh, how, how you have improved upon uh, this drug and this target. Because as I said earlier, any uh, success clinically, either success or lack of success clinically, right? It's, it's a good trove of information uh, to evaluate. And so I'm happy um, to follow up with you, Martin. Um, yeah. If you get in touch it, with VAS, I'm happy to advise on next steps. Right. 
uh, it was a combination therapy. So uh, I'm just bettering their approach. It's in the same pathway. So that's, that's the goal. Okay. I don't, I'm not modifying anything with their drug or target. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank yeah. And thank you, Mike. That's an excellent question. And also in terms of services provided to our faculty um, at USC, these are the exact type of scenarios we'd like to you to come to us with um, and we can have the conversation, map out the different pathways. Because to Eva's point today, there's no one way, but we'll look at pathways and find the best one that suits you and the type of research. And also the receiving partner and, and, and that works for them. And we'd love to follow up with you, Mike, and, and connect you back with Eva. So really appreciate your question. Anyone else? I, I have a question. Okay. Yes. Thank you, uh, Eva, for this wonderful talk. My question is outside of oncology, but could apply to different disciplines. Um, if your target is uh, promiscuous, has multiple uh, signaling pathways, but it's tied to disease, does that kill it as a target? Does it have to be very specific or could you target something that's not very specific? So there are multiple ways to answer that, right? So um, that's why I said in the beginning, it's important to look at the target and its effect, but also at the signaling pathway. And so if a target is promiscuous and it clearly has safety signals, is there anything else um, that you can target maybe downstream that has more specific effect? And so this really depends on the, the pathway in question, the targeting question and how big really the, the risks um, are. Um, it, could be, it could be small, for example, if you are looking to block a transmembrane signaling you know, molecule uh, that has broad expression somewhere else in the gut. And you think that if you block this in the gut, it will have detrimental effect. You can always try to de design a, a biologic, right? To avoid uh, targeting of the gut if that's the only challenge that you see. So there are ways to mitigate that problem within the pathway, there's ways to mitigate potential issue of toxicity with the type of uh, therapeutic agent that you're using. And also with um, that will dictate how it's administered, right? How it's processed by the body. So um, happy to chat about uh, what might work best and there already might be um, some information out there on prior targeting of this pathway and risks that are um, that have seen um, that you have uncovered or um, we can uncover together. Thank you. And oftentimes some of these conversations require a confidentiality agreement and really, mm -hmm. you know, rolling up your sleeves and digging through all the papers that are published or all the other molecules that might even have pleiotropic targeting and, you know, are perhaps indicated against VGF, but, you know, we know that they target all these other molecules as well. And so it does require a lot of scientific diligence. Do we have more questions? We certainly have a little more time. Anyone else? I see a question in the chat, but this is more general. Venkata, are you with um, USC? Is she still on? Is USC, um, not with USC, is USC giving service on projects or interest in IP? Well, we, we have the USC Stevens Center um, for Innovation that focuses on um, IP generated at the university. Um, if you're looking for advice or consultation on IP matters that are outside the university, you can definitely contact us. We have relationships with various um, experts throughout LA that could um, we could provide um, you their contact information and also understand better about what your question is in terms of the IP. So yes, so the, the answer is um, not as a um, specific service, it's more consultation where we direct you to the right service for the IP consultation. There's accelerators we're connected with that have those con um, consultants. So happy to connect with you after the call.
And if you already have a pitch deck or, um, mm, yes. you know, a company, uh, you know, feel free. And that that's not related to USC. Um, happy to provide my direct contact information and potentially could be evaluated by Zontogeny. Um, and obviously there are a number of other outfits that you might like to, to reach out to. But again, for USC specific matters, VAS and CCDD is uh, your first uh, stop. Any other questions? Or if there's questions that come up, please feel to email me as well and we can get you directly connected to Eva to get those questions answered. All right, no, no more questions? Okay, so um, they will, you'll see upcoming um, announcements of the follow-on executives from CCDD that will be providing seminars in November and December. We highly encourage you to join us and look forward to seeing you again. Um, Eva, thank you so much. It, like, again, it was an exceptional um, amount of information and so informative. Thank you, Dr. Afringa. I see your thumbs up. <laughs> um, and I saw some um, also direct messages asking for the presentation afterwards um, that, that can be distributed as well as the recording. I just want to thank everyone again for your time today. Dr. Tudorska, that was fantastic. And this, um, again, I see um, Eva, um, Ita in your commentary on the chat. Not only is drug development iterative, all these conversations and interactions are as well. So there's never, again, one way to interact. Please contact us and we'll, we'll always um, have the conversation first and then see what's the best path for you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Have a great day.